All right, so here's some big takeaways from Mackenzie Wark's book, Capital is Dead. The first one that really strikes me is that Wark is very tired of, of um, people on the left who sort of idolize Marx or Marx fanboys or whatever, um, and who's, who think that the main task is finally getting Marx right and then applying Marx to whatever the situation is. And she says, you know, let's be in our own time in the same way that they were in their time. Um, and stop idolizing or treating Marx's writings like it's some sort of, um, you know, biblical text to cite and quote and apply wholesale. And, you know, this is a big point um, that I really appreciate. She says we can't afford to live in the past anymore and think in this way. And I would apply that to people on both the left and the right, whether they're, you know, worshiping Karl Marx or they're worshiping Adam Smith here. Uh, I don't know which direction I'm pointing. Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman, you know, these on the right are thinkers and, and figures who, um, who people idolize and sort of hark back to. We can't afford to do that anymore. We're living in a time when technology is driving change so fast that it's hard, as we all know, to keep up with just how to use it. But we need to keep up with what it's doing to us and even get ahead of it. And that's very difficult to imagine. But that's what she's saying. You know, it's not it's not useful to dwell in the past, um, especially in this type of climate. If we're going to have any hope of kind of gain, regaining control of the human situation, we've got to think in the present and even think forward. So, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche in his book on the use and abuse of history for life um, argues that there are these three types of history, the monumental, the antiquarian or genealogical, and the critical. And he says all three are necessary, um, but the critical is perhaps the most necessary because otherwise we tend to, in the case of monumental history, create these heroes and these iconic um, visions of the past. And this, he, he says, makes us just sort of worship those figures or those iconic episodes and dwell there as though we're kind of in a museum. And genealogical history is where we're trying to go back and figure out who we are based on where we've been in our people's past, our family's past, and so on. That's also necessary for giving people a sense of their identity, but it also can become a pastime that helps us to avoid the here and now and is really not as relevant as we, we oftentimes want to make it out to be for understanding who we are at this present time. So they're both important but they both can become traps. And then Nietzsche says there's this third type of history, which is critical history, which, which smashes idols and, um, and gets rid of episodes in the past. There are many ways to interpret this teaching of Nietzsche, but I, I relate it to what Mackenzie Work is saying because in a way she's doing critical history. She's telling the stories of how we got here, but in order to kind of crash through the old icons, the old ideas that are weighing us down. And, and this is what Nietzsche was trying to get at. In. Wark uses a special term to describe how she does her critical history, you might say. She deturns the ideas. And this comes from, I, it comes from Debord, again, I think from the Situationists. She likes this idea of, yes, we need to learn from past thinkers. In fact, she says that understanding past masters or past thinkers is actually very essential. So she's not saying we should throw all that out and not know about it because we can't think with, without a basis for thinking, and that's our basis, right? So it's very important to learn those thinkers like Marx and like Adam Smith. But at the same time, we need to take those ideas for what they are, partly in the past, dealing with their own times, 
and we need to extract the inspiration from them without worshipfully following them or slavishly following them. They provide pathways, but they can't provide grand solutions. And I think within Wark's thought, there's a questioning of whether grand solutions are even um, really desirable. Okay, um, In the past, we've gone through many of these grand narrative ways of thinking. Um, in which there's going to be some sort of end where everything is perfect and we finally figure everything out. Wark's concentration on the vulgar, I think, indicates that um, she also wants us to get away from this idea that there's one grand um, solution. Another takeaway for me, obviously, really, is that capital has lost its unquestioned primacy. So I've learned that these tractors are full of software, right? And they're run on computing. And um, so the farmers, they go into massive debt to get these things, or they even rent them for a time because they, they can't afford them. Um, and if they break down in any small way, they can't fix them. And in fact, they are obliged contractually, I think, basically, um, there's no other legitimate route for them to get their tractors fixed other than to take them to a dealer um, who uses proprietary software to fix them. Uh, these things are humongous, even to like transport them when they don't run could cost thousands of dollars. What that says to me is that John Deere has become a vectorless actor. The real control and source of profit has become its proprietary software, its ability to more or less manipulate the behavior and buying practices of these farmers. And even if it stopped manufacturing or outsourced its manufacturing of the tractors, which for, I don't know, maybe they have, it would have a lot of power and make a lot of profit off of its vectorless power. So this is happening more and more. And yes, I think a lot of us don't get it. I have a hard time getting it, or um, I'm not sure I'm willing to say that capital is dead and that this is a completely other, uh, different class uh, and a different source of power. But I think I should try. I should try. I'm going to continue to try to see this through Wark's eyes because she's probably right. Um, she makes the point that it's very difficult for people to to be able to fathom this kind of change and to see it ahead of time, ahead of when it really becomes a major problem. Um, we know it's becoming a problem now. So whatever we want to call it, um, we need to think about it more. Uh, so I agree with that. Um, and furthering on that point, um, Wark is arguing in this book that people who disdain technical knowledge will never understand what's going on. I think that's true, right? We are encouraged to be in our little bubbles, right? And so the non-technical people um, are encouraged by the very economy that we, that we live in to not know much about technology. Those farmers are having to figure it out and in some cases become hackers because they literally can't afford to do otherwise. Um, we may not be able to do that, right? We may not all be able to become hackers. As a political science professor, I feel like I'm more adept at technology and understanding it than a lot of my peers. That doesn't mean, though, that I could ever hack a John Deere tractor. <laughs> but what I can do is not compartmentalize in my mind and not be so specialized that basically I don't even want to hear about it or learn what I can about it, or I disdain talking to people who have technical knowledge. Work several times in this book makes the point that in order to solve the problems that we have now, we have to talk to other people. We have to learn um, what, they, what they know, and we have to work together um, using our various expertise to try to figure out uh, what's going on and what to do about it. And, and that reminds me again of this guy, Jaron Lanier. Uh, I put a video of, uh, up in the playlist for this particular playlist on work of Lanier talking about uh, social media 
and how it has changed our lives and why we should be concerned about the type of data gathering. And that speech talks about how we got there and how a lot of, a lot of the people um, involved in the early stages did not anticipate where we were ending up. I haven't read these books, but I want to. These are books by Lanier. You are not a gadget, a manifesto, uh, who owns the future, and 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now. They sound interesting. Um, Lanier would be an example of a person who has tried hard, I think, to uh, take his technical knowledge, his knowledge of history, um, combine it with a knowledge of people. He admits that he doesn't know a lot about politics, but he's sort of reaching out with the knowledge that he has to people who do, and you know, more or less saying, hey, listen to me, right? Um, let's talk about this. So I think that's what Wark wants to see more and more of. I agree with that. I think we need to stop living in our little cubicles and we need to basically stop disdaining other people's knowledge as not relevant for us. This is one of the ways that neoliberalism or the vectorless economy now um, uh, keep us from communicating with each other and coming up with solutions. Anyway, so I really like this book. I hope that you enjoyed this series. My very talkative cat and I say, have a good day.